Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica and welcome to The Fan Carpet. If we go back to the beginning, was there a defining moment for you to get into the film industry? Well, gosh, um, I'll be honest with you, when I was a, a lot of actors say, and I've read this so many times, a lot of actors say they knew they wanted to be an actor when they were eight. And I grew up in quite a tough housing estate in a mining, well, it was a mining village, but it's not a mining village any longer. The mine's closed in Coat, Coat Bridge in Scotland. So I grew up there in the 70s. So that industry had finished 10, 15 years previously and nothing was coming through. And we were just about to hit the, you know, the austerity and the, the unemployment zone that is Margaret Thatcher's Britain. So it was tough times and uh, quite a very sort of masculine, not gang warfare, but a tough, a tough, tough environment to grow up in. And, um, and I, it's a funny thing. I, I always knew there was something I wanted to express myself because of my, 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 the environment I grew in, I grew up in, I always knew there was something possibly different about me and the way I looked at the world. For instance, I love superheroes. And I used to, I used to um, corrode my friends into dressing up as very, I used to do all the costumes and everything and we were all running about the streets as Batman and Robin. And so in a way that's play. When you're a kid, it's play, but it's without inhibition. And I would say as the years went by, that inhibition never left me, but it left all my mates. Uh, so, yeah, I wasn't exactly still running about in the old uh, Superman costume, but, you know, I, I still had that sort of um, drive to, to discover something other of, of myself. And that, that was sort of envisaged through, um, I realised through um, amateur dramatics, school dramatics, uh, very early on, I was doing really good roles at primary school and then at secondary school. Uh, then I left, um, I left secondary school. Um, you know, I had, a, I had an interview with my careers teacher back then, 1979. And I clearly remember saying I want to be an actor. And my favourite movie growing up, I don't know if you remember it, The Vikings starring Tony Curtis and um, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Douglas and Tony. Curtis, do you remember? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah, that's great film. Loved that movie. And, um, and that was when I remember looking at the credits and who is a DOP and, you know, what is a direct, what's, what's all, and then and breaking it down, and starting to break it down. And I joined an amateur dramatics and I got very interested in theatre. And that was just a natural progression through to drama school. But when I left drama school, I went straight into Pitt Lockery Festival Theatre, did rep, I did rep all over Scotland, um, major theatres, did lots of touring, Scottish play Macbeth and stuff like that. So I was, uh, yeah, so yeah, um, for me, being an actor was in a sense a bit of, a bit of escapism. It was like um, becoming somebody else was a good thing because you know, as I say, single parent family, three brothers, sister who sadly passed away when she was very young, not a lot of money. And we were all expected just to leave school and go straight into work, into the, the local steelworks or factories. And that's what happened, that's what I did. But I couldn't have told you how to get into drama school, I wouldn't have known. But when I went to amateur dramatics, and then of course I found out about all this kind of stuff, slowly that, that sort of ambition grew. And I got coached by um, an actor called Ian Bannon, who you might know, who lived in Coatbridge. Um, and I, he kindly helped me with some addition pieces. And I got into every single drama school I tried for, believe it or not. Um, and then I ended up going to Edinburgh, the same drama school as Kevin McKidd. I uh, went there, Queen Market College, left there. And just, yeah, Theatre, slowly I started to do sort of short films, came down to London and slowly things just started to happen in the film industry and I became more and more fascinated by actual screen acting. It's a very different medium from theatre, the intimacy. Um, and yeah, 
um, I would say I, got, I was in a film called The Wee Man that starred Martin Compson. I don't know if you've seen it. It's I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it. A gangster movie about a real life criminal, not a criminal any longer, but he had been a criminal in his younger days called Paul Ferris. So Martin played him and I got offered a, a small part of a sort of psych, psychotic, psychopathic Scottish policeman. And I've been playing psychopaths ever since. <laughs> uh, and I'm so nice. Yeah. Why did the cast me as these terrible people? I don't know. Don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah that led that led that led to um, some some TV work and um, and then I yeah I got the call to audition for Schemers. That, that is a hell of a story. How I got that part. Yeah, awesome. So, so what was it about schemas that enticed you to get involved? Well, what happened was um, I knew nothing about this. Um, I was in a short film with a good friend of mine, Alex Reese, uh, called One Round in a Chamber. And we just filmed that. And he remembered me. I played a sort of scary character in that. And um, I, he was up for a role in uh, Schemers. And he just sent me an email on this Friday night, but it was, because it was a while ago now, 90, 2006, 2016, sorry. 2017, and it was a Friday night. He said, I'll, I'm auditioning for a movie tomorrow, and I think you'd be really good for one of the roles, the main bad guy. Send an email to the, direct, to the director today. So I sent an email off to the director and the producer of the production company, not expecting to hear anything back. And um, they looked at my showreel, which was mainly made up of the wee man, and um, I got a call back almost immediately that Friday evening um, from one of the production team asking me to go and audition in, in, in South London in a, in a converted church. So, wow. And they said they would send me the sides and they didn't send me the sides. I didn't get the sides until half past nine, something like that. I was on the way to the audition. There's no time to learn anything. And I was a little bit put out by that, but because I, I, need to, I, I need to know what I'm doing because I just need it in my head. So um, I was never very good at sort of sight reading. Anyway, yeah, I pulls up and um, I won't say who, but it was a very famous Scottish actor in before me. And an even more famous actor came in to the room, the audition room, and he was going in after me. And I'm sat in between, and they obviously know each other, these two, and they're talking over my head. Just, they weren't ignoring me, but they just knew each other. And I'm sitting, focusing straight ahead, thinking, I don't know my lines, and I don't know what I'm going to do with this. So this actor goes in, and the, the casting director, hey, how's it going? And I can hear them laughing in the room, and I'm going, I've got no chance here. Um, and they, they, they come out, the, the casting director thanked them, and, and I get up to go and do my stuff in the casting director says, sorry, Alistair, is there any way you could just wait? I'm, I'm completely built up for this. And this other actor, he had a casting or something and he had, so he jumped over me, he went in before me. And so the, it's funny how your mind plays tricks from their perspective, because I've spoken to them all since. You know, they just saw this wired guy sat there, you know, and but from my perspective, I'm completely thinking, I've got absolutely no chance here. Because this was even, listening the, to the sounds from the, the audition room was even worse than the first guy. Hey, how's it going? Oh, and he comes out and, we'll see you on set and well done. And I'm just thinking, I'll just go now. And then the casting director, again, somebody else came in and she didn't, she didn't mean it, but she started speaking to this other person. And something happened to me, Mark. I became really, really dark and really focused in a way that I've never been before. And uh, I was so angry about the way I had been treated up. I had been perceived. Because since then, I've spoken to everybody in the schemas that was there. And that's not how they viewed it. You know what I mean? But it's interesting how nerves can get to you in any walk of life, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, any road. 
I'm furious. And uh, the casting director eventually turns around to me, puts her hand out towards me, and I just brushed right by her. And I walked into the, the casting room and there was a trestle table with about eight or nine people on it. And the director, a, 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 another person, a producer and stuff, they all get up to shake my hands and I just brush past them. And I, and I decided, you know, bad guys wear black, you know, black jeans, black boots, black jacket, everything was black, black, my hair, everything. Black, everything was black, including my mood. And I thought, well, I'm not going to get this, but I'm going to walk out of this room with some dignity. So I turned my back on a lot of them. And all I could remember about the, the, the sage that I had been sent was that Dave, sorry, Fergie, Des Fergie, was owed money. And Des Fergie is a powerful guy, and he never, ever gets up, up off his arse. He gets his minions to go and do his dirty work. The fact that he's had to get up and go into this room, um, you know, uh, there, it's not good. But of course, so I'm sat there, I can't remember any lines. Uh, I've just swept past, been really rude to everybody. The director says, so Alistair Rev, like, uh, how was your journey? I just said nothing to him. He's just staring at me. And um, the, he's talking away. And, I, and, I, and at the very end of this, trestle table. I can't remember his surname, but there was this young guy called Guy, who was a sort of a junior writer, script writer. And, um, and he was looking at me and he was the only one that got this. He knew that I had went in there as Des. And I could see in his eyes. I saw he knows, damn, I have to be quick. And I looked at him and I sort of said, uh, who the fuck are you looking at? This is, a, this is a casting, remember? And he went, huh? And I went, what the fuck are you looking at? Don't fucking look at me like that. Do you know who I am? I says, you owe me some money. And like, they're all laughing. They all think, oh, ah, yeah, yeah. I went, why are you all fucking laughing? No, no, I'm not Des, I'm Alistair Thompson Mills. I've been treated like fucking shite today. And I'm gonna get something out of this. I want you all put your fucking wallets on the table. Guy's nodding, he's laughing. And I walked over to him and I went, what the fuck are you laughing at? <laughs> I said, if you don't stop laughing, I'm going, to, I'm going to fucking rip your fucking head off your shoulders. I'm going to rip your face off. Stop laughing. And he stopped laughing. And I looked and the director that stands up, producer stands up, went, oh, I, I said, you can just fucking sit there as well. I'm owed money. I don't come out for this kind of shit. Get all your wallets on the table. And they all started taking out their money. They all thought, this guy's a lunatic. So in my mind, I'm thinking, how long can I keep this going for? And there was a sort of uh, lamp with a single light bulb. And I, I grabbed the lamp and I smashed it off the floor. <laughs> and I went, just give me my fucking money, you bunch of amateurs. So they all put money on the table and whatnot. And I just thought, you know what? Fucking forget it. And I just walked out the door. And that was the end of my audition and probably really my career. And uh, funnily enough, guy, young guy, he ran after me. He said, Alistair, come back, come back. Were you Des? I went, of course I was being Des. I'm not a lunatic. And um, he went, come back, please, you've got to come back. So uh, they took me back into the room and I said, listen, I apologise. I, I, I made a decision as the actor to become the character and just be the character. I took a chance. They were all like shaking. Uh, but they loved it, you know, and I could see, then I started to feel the excitement of, oh, hold on, hold on. And um, it's funny, there was a producer there of another, she was producing schemas, but she, also, she was also something to do with schemas, but also something to do with another production. And she said, she said, listen, just before we continue, Alistair, can you do a Russian accent? And I went, yeah. Um, she said, I need to talk to you after this. What you just did, I'm doing another production. I need to talk to you. And I'm thinking inside my head, I should have done this more often. <laughs> so uh, obviously it just became a normal interview. You know, what do you think about the script? And well, I haven't had a chance to read it. I only got sent at half nine. And I just became myself. And I'm quite an amicable, friendly guy. But I was giving you a little piece of I haven't told anybody that story, so you've got that's a, a new one. 
but that's that and um yeah so it's still part of me after the audition after all the questionings and all the rest of it i thought there's no way they can get me it they must think i'm a play lunatic but i was filming next day in epping forest and something for tv and the phone rang and said it's it's the production office and they said um we can't imagine anybody else playing playing Fergie. We'd love you to do it. And I apologised again for my... I've never done it since. You know, you just... Can you imagine going in for Star Wars and doing something like that? <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine or, uh, how to destroy your career in one easy move? It, wa it worked for me. Uh, yeah, so... But um, what was your original question? What did I think about... What was it, the script? Oh, the, no, uh, what was it about the scheme as the entire shoot to get involved? Well... That's a good question because, of course, after I got offered the part, they sent me the script, and then the name Dave McLean entered my life. And uh, wow, what a man! Never met anybody like him, absolutely, utterly unique. I love him to bits. He's, he's just what a man. I mean, he's so, so interesting. The stories, where he's been, what he's done, what he's been through, his friends. His lover Dundee, which he also gave to me. I was, I'm a Glaswegian, but I'd never, I had been to Dundee, but I'd never properly, properly been to Dundee. And just his enthusiasm. And without him, there wouldn't be a schemers. So all his stories and everything was in that first, that first um, draft or the second draft or whatever it was. I just fell in love with it because what I read, and it's not really changed that much, I just thought, this, this is a heist movie. This is a heist movie. This is what this says. Young guys, you know, they're not stealing from a bank, but they're going, in a sense, they're trying to achieve, they're trying to gain something that, that they, they shouldn't have any right to gain, which is obviously putting on the, the Iron Maiden uh, concert at the end in the Caird Hall. Um, and it is, it's a heist movie with, with all those, but, but with heart and with soul and it's got, it's got a gentle sort of drive to it. There, there is some hard, obviously the gangsters are quite tough, but the boys themselves, Connor, you know, Grant, Sean, three of them, lo lovely guys, brilliant actors. It was just, you know, it was such fun to work with them. And, you know, because I was a little bit more experienced, like Connor, for instance, I think he'd only done a couple of short films. So, you know, they were, they were so keen to learn and listen of anybody. Mm. You know, of Dave, of uh, the DOP Allen, of any of me, you know. Uh, and I actually remember speaking to the three of them because I'm a massive Michael Caine fan. And I would say this to any young actor who get, gets cast as any role, maybe the first role on screen, is to go to YouTube and watch um, Michael Caine on acting. Absolute brilliant. Gives you all the technique, gives you, it's, it's all, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, he does an acting class about film. I think he did it at RADA in the, in the, the late 80s. But it's on YouTube and it's called Michael Caine on acting. And if you're a young actor, you have got to look at that. Because he, mm. you know, knows what he's doing. So yeah, um, but yeah, Dave McLean is like a, a stick, it's like a stick of rock. He goes right through that. Have you seen the movie? Yeah, you've seen it. You've seen it. What, what did you think? I liked it. I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the film. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, I've been reading quite a lot of the reviews, and um, and, and I know that the publicity department themselves say, you know, it's, it's close to train spotting. Personally speaking, I don't think it's that close to train spotting. It's got overtures, but it, it, for me, it, if anything, it's more a Gregory scale or. A, of that sinking feeling, you know, it's more, it's much more gentle than train spotting, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's it, it, it's almost a comedy. I don't know if you would agree with this, and it's got amazing, funny set pieces, but it's got heart, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Dave, it does. And, and what I like about the character, what of, of the what Connor did with it was, you know, he didn't just make Dave an out and out goody two shoes. The, there's an edge to Dave. You could look at it and think, you know, you're a bit 
self-centered and a bit out for yourself, but actually it's his enthusiasm. He's not out to hurt anybody. He's just, like the movie says, he's a schemer. He's almost like the Artful Dodger, isn't he? He's kind of just thinking on his feet, you know? Um, but yeah, all that came across and I just, I fell in love with Dez. The times that he is on screen, I think what he brings is conflict. The movie needs conflict. And I think he's, su he's such a dangerous guy to enter these young guys' lives. And the moment they get mixed up with him, in a sense, they're so out of their depth, they're lost. And, and th th there's really no way for them to recover that. They're just too young and too inexperienced. And in a sense, I think Dave's just, sorry, Des is just almost, almost toying with them, isn't he? You know, it's like, he's, there's no threat, you know. It's just uh, almost like he's almost like just passing the time. Um, but I think he sees something in the character of Dave. I think he sees something potentially that in the original script, there was, um, there was more scenes that we didn't use in the end where um, there's a lot of backstory between uh, Des and, uh, and Dave's uh, dad, played by Kit, uh, Willie, and that back in the day, my character had ripped his character off and had left him penniless. So there's a lot of frisson between those two. And in the original draft, um, it was a bit more depth to, to, to Des in that he, um, he saw Connor as another way to get at Willie, to maybe bring, to, to bring Connor into his world and make him a gangster. And that would, even, that would destroy Willie even more. Now, although you don't necessarily see that storyline resolved, it's still there, and I think his interest in, in Dave is still, there's still enough there that the audience get the idea is why, why is he so interested in, in this young, why is he allowing him, why is he giving him a lot more rope, why does he show more interest in him, and that is the reason, but the audience won't probably get that because it was taken out, so you, but although you, it's like you know yourself with a script, with, a, with, with any sort of story, you know, more, there's more going on than meets the eye. Uh, and um, Des, you know, for instance, you know, one of the things that interested me was um, that I really liked was Des allowing the boys to be invited into his house. Do you remember that scene? Yeah. Where, where he, he, normally that wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that interested me as an actor. Why? Because he wants uh, Connor's character Dave to see his world you know, the, the surroundings, the opulence, the money. He wants to impress him. Yeah. Um, and uh, ultimately he doesn't. Ultimately, Dave chooses his dad. Um, but I, I, I don't want to waste the end of the movie, but you know what happened yourself with, mm -hmm. with the other guys. The other guys. So, um, I mean, it, it just seemed like to me, potentially this could be one of the, the best films out of Scotland in 10, 15 years. Awesome. Um, what, so, are you, what are you hoping audiences will take away from the film when they get the chance to see it? It's funny, when it, when it was made, the word that sort of came to mind was, I hope they have fun. And I hope, you know, older generations remember the exuberance of youth and feel connected to that memory. And younger generations, no matter what era, just connect with that kind of exuberance of being young. Um, so the whole kind of blase, fun aspect, the fact that they, they, they act without thinking, which is what young people tend to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, they're all quite good, kind-hearted souls, I think. Um, but now that we've got COVID, now that we've got um, now that we've got this world that we live in, and because the cinemas have not been opened for quite a long time, um, and, and there isn't a lot of new material out there, and unfortunately, yeah, the, the audiences won't be as big as could have been. But I do think that, and I'm already getting that buzz from a lot of family and friends in Scotland, that, they, that you know, the people that went to see the preview on Monday, that I've heard, have said, I needed to see something like that. That's made me feel good. And it's all down to Dave McLean. He's the most amazing man. Without him, there wouldn't be a schemers.
it's all based on his life, of course, his early life, him and John and um, uh, and Sean, uh, his friends, and um, and Tara is wonderful. Um, and, my, and of course, um, I haven't even spoke about Rianne, who played my wife, Chrissy, absolutely fantastic actress, you know. And uh, what she does with that role, I don't know if you thought it yourself, but she's blinking, chilling, isn't she? Mm -hmm. You know, she's the power behind the throne, really, isn't she? Yeah. It was wonderful working, wonderful working with her. She's such a good actor. Uh, and, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that as well. Wonderful. Um, and just before I let you go, um, uh, what are you looking forward to getting back to once, we're, once it's safe to do so? Do you have any projects well, on, the, on the horizon? Yeah, actually, um, I've got quite a good sort of story. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, Schemers won the Audience Award at Edinburgh, the Edinburgh National oh, yeah. Film Festival. And uh, a lot of industry people were up there. And um, I got a phone call three days after that from my agent saying um, a, a, a production company called Grindstone and a director called Phil Peel and an actor called Melissa DeMol want to audition you for their next feature film, which is called Gone to Ground. Big budget, it's already got a distribution deal, um, fantastic script. Um, and they had seen Schemers in one of the previews in Edinburgh, liked me, phoned my agent, and I, got, I found myself in London two days later auditioning for, um, for the role of um, Justin, who is an ex-paratrooper who suffers from uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And it's a kind of psychological drama with some comedy elements. Um, it's quite dark. It's about the, uh, the sex industry in London, but it's about a girl, a Polish girl, who manages to escape it. And, they, and I play a quite a dark character, but at the end of that movie, you kind of find out that what you thought a person was, it turns out that they weren't. And, and there's, a lot, there's a lot of mixed messages. Um, but I went down, read for the part, and I got offered it. And I, start, I, I was filming it from August right through to December last year. And then we had a little break. Um, um, we were supposed to start filming again in March. And of course, COVID happened. Mm. Um, so, but I just got called back to set. Then we, we went down to Southampton do docks two weeks ago, and we finished. And we finished up. Did my, my two scenes that I had to do, and um, that's all. That's all. That's in the can now. So I, I actually spoke to the director this morning, and um, he showed a rough cut to to, to the uh, to, to the financiers and the producers, and they're really happy. Gone to ground. Remember that name. It's. Um, Stunning script. It's, it really, really pulls the roll over your eyes. I think, I think that's, a, that's going to be... And that came directly from Schemers. I played Alan, Alan Thick for American TV. Um, Alan Thick was a kind of comedian uh, actor. And um, I played him. Uh, that came from Schemers. So, you know, Schemers it seems to be doing well for all our, our careers um, and um, I, love, I love the movie. I, I would say Schemers is probably thus far the best movie I've ever been involved with. That's wonderful. That really is and so much has come from it. So, um, well, I'll leave it there and it's been such a pleasure to speak to you this morning. Um, good luck with everything and um, I look forward to whatever you come up, what comes, what comes next. Yeah. Thanks for, thank you for uh, interviewing me. Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more content next time. Got this new band, going to be massive. Who are they? You two. Never heard of them.
I'm here on the largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you round Mallorca. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.